Today on Twin Cam, part two of our look around the Lancaster Insurance Classic Motor Show at the NEC in Birmingham. Last time we looked around halls four and eight, and if you didn't catch that one, I'll put a card in the corner and a link in the description so you can catch up on that before we start exploring the rest of the show. When I was editing the first of these videos, I thought I'd recorded about the right amount to split it into two videos, but I was wrong. So this has become part two of three. We'll begin right at the entrance to Hall 5, just as you come down the stairs from Hall 4 and this Honda Acti. I'm a firm believer in K-Car supremacy, and even more so in K-Truck supremacy. But weirdly, I'm not a huge fan of this aesthetic, when it's on anything that isn't Japanese. Suddenly, for some reason, if you put lots of shiny bits, incredibly low suspension and deep metallic paintwork on something both Japanese and completely unsuited for such luxuries in its standard spec, I go nuts for it. I cannot explain, considering I like functional and modest cars, why making a K-Truck less suitable for its original purpose makes it even cooler than it already was, but it does. For me, this particular Honda Acti, which hails from somewhere between 1977 and 82, strikes that perfect balance. It has the paintwork, it has the suspension, it has the wheels, but despite the huge work that's gone into beautifying it, it also retains an industrial and utilitarian streak with the tin top to the load bay. Sticking with Hondas of the 1970s, further up the hall are a couple of Honda clubs, and on one of the stands, this adorable little 1973 Honda Z600. As I said, K-Car supremacy. Though this little fella isn't actually a K-Car, as thanks to this being a 600 and therefore having a huge 598cc two-cylinder engine with twin carburettors, it's just too fast and exotic to be a part of that classification, producing 36 brake horsepower at 9,000 RPM. You've got to love Honda. Despite the sophistication of the engines, the Z and its non-coupe counterpart, the N, had leaf springs at the back, which of course spread out the load, hence why a lot of vans use them. But that also means that they take up a lot of room under the car. But K cars are very small, and the Z is so small in fact that the bushes at the rearwards end of the leaves poke out at the back. Next to the little Z600 is yet another period Honda with a tiny engine, this 1968 Honda S800. I'm sure everybody here knows of my love for British cars, but this is an occasion where the traditional British sports car pales in comparison. The S800 is tiny, which is good. Its rear wheel drive, again good, and revs to 9,500 RPM. Perfection. In fact, the 791cc four-pot engine is fed by four carburettors and produces 70 horsepower. That's a Mini Cooper S power figure from an engine less than three quarters the size. To add to Honda's engineering complexity and general madness, early S800s were chain driven to an independent rear end, though a later one, as I'd expect this one is, but I'm not sure, would have a more conventional live axle rear end with four links and a panhard rod. Our next car is another Honda, and I think there's a theme appearing here, but we cannot leave the Honda Sports stand without first having a gander at the S800's long-awaited successor the Honda S2000. This car was launched the year before I was born in 1999, and its 10-year production run to 2009 helped to make this one of the attainable hero cars of my childhood. It's a shame, therefore, that prices are now skyrocketing, but that's par for the course when it comes to cool JDM sports cars. The S2000 managed to carry on the exceptional engineering of its predecessors when it comes to the engine. While its 2.0-litre four-banger is more than two and a half times the size of the old cars, it remained, for over a decade, the world's most powerful engine on specific output, producing 124 horsepower per litre. Inside, it's just as focused as its father, but with a digital dashboard, designed to resemble that of an early 90s Honda-powered McLaren Grand Prix car. There's another Honda coming here, but it's the last one, I promise, and it has to be done for this is a 1990 Honda NSX. 
Not just another example of Honda's ability to create something sensible, cool and incredibly capable, but my favourite supercar of all time. Like a lot of its counterparts, the NSX's styling is rather subdued, but it carries a sense of elegance that the likes of the Ferrari 348 don't. And additionally, this car has two incredibly special links. The one we all know of and are reminded of incessantly is to Ayrton Senna, but the second is rather more important in the context of history. Gordon Murray, designer of Brabham and McLaren Formula 1 cars, chose the NSX as one of his inspirations for creating the McLaren F1 supercar. Right, that's it for Hondas, but a good section of Hall 5 is populated by the Japanese, so let's cross over to Toyota, and this 1975 Toyota Celica 1600 GT. The GT is an incredibly rare spec in the UK, as Toyota only ever brought over 300 cars in order to homologate them for the British Saloon Car Championship. These cars sport one of Toyota's iconic four-cylinder engines, the 2TG, at 1600cc with twin carburettors and twin camshafts operating eight valves, producing about 110 horsepower. Between the crank and the road, a five-speed gearbox and an LSD. These first-gen Celicas are one of the few Toyotas I think are genuinely pretty, but they're also incredibly recognisable thanks to the inset headlamps and grille, surrounded by the stylized indicators and bumpers that curve upwards. This must be one of the very early examples of bumpers being integrated into the design of the bodywork. Fast forward just over a decade to 1988 and this Toyota MR2. There's an idea that's existed in the motoring world for decades that the open-top sports car died in the late 1970s in favour of the hot hatch, but that's utter rubbish. Just because companies like MG and Triumph shut up shop, that doesn't mean the world stopped turning. In the decade between that and the launch of the Mazda MX-5 in 1989, a number of companies started building small sports cars, and this AW11 MR2 is probably the best. Much like the later Mazda, the MR2 took the best influences of older European sports cars, including the basic recipe and stance of the Fiat X19 and engineering know-how from Lotus in tuning the suspension. That recipe consists of a Revy four-cylinder engine in the middle, drive to the rear and a manual gearbox in between. The power unit being an AW11 is a 1600cc 16-valve fuel-injected 4AGE another of Toyota's iconic engines, and one that became amongst the favourites for the tuning community from the early 1980s through to today. But what's even closer to the tuning community's heart is the 2JZ Straight 6, and its most famous home can be found in this 1993 Mark IV Toyota Supra. This car drew my eye not because it was a Supra in particular, because I don't think they're very good looking and they're a bit of a cliché, but instead because this car is both immaculate and completely original. This is a UK original car and has been with its owner for over 18 years. It's an absolute credit to him that he has kept such an iconic car for so long and kept it in such remarkable original condition, especially considering the sheer wealth of upgrades available for the Mark IV Supra. Despite the fact I'm not one of those people that are in awe of the Supra, I have gradually started to come around to the bubbly 90s styling and the fact that these are not just quick modified. They are ridiculously fast, just as they are. This is a Supra TT6, and not only is it a launch year model, but it comes with that 2JZ at 3 litres and twin turbocharged, producing a quoted 325 horsepower. Strapped to a 6-speed manual, that means 0-60 in 4.6 seconds, and that's quicker than a Ferrari 355. Almost opposite the Supra is another incredibly original Japanese sports car, and it's this 1993 Mazda RX-7. It's another of those cars that are seemingly always modified to the nth degree, and it's both refreshing and astonishing to see such a pair. Both this RX-7 and the Supra are from the same year, in the boom of Japanese cars so incredible that those growing up in this era completely ignored European cars, and for good reason. Nobody in the world was matching the engineering purity and ingenuity of the Japanese. 
Mazda just would not let go of the Wankel engine, and for that I'm eternally grateful. I adore individually engineered cars, and there's not much more individuality than in a rotary engine. The smoothness and noise of these units is something to behold, making it incredibly special in the history of motoring. Under the bonnet of this car is a twin rotor Wankel engine, displacing at 1.3 litres and strapped to it two turbochargers, producing 255 brake horsepower. On the other end of the FD RX7 Club stand is the opposite end of production. This is a 2002 Mazda RX-7 Type R Bathurst, making it one of the last RX-7s built. This one is modified, but only mechanically. This car has received an exhaust, an ECU, larger injectors, and the twin rotor engine has been ported, allowing a power output of 385 brake horsepower. Cosmetically though, it is standard, just that bit beefed up from the original with meaner bodywork and wheels, a splitter, side skirts and a ruddy great wing on the back. But what you might also notice are the Mazda badges, because the 93 and 02 cars we've seen here are Japanese originals, with the 02 imported to the UK in 2018. But the 93 doesn't feature any Mazda badges, as it was never actually sold as a Mazda, but rather an Anfini RX-7. In the early 1990s, Mazda introduced a further three marks for Japan. Anfini, Autozam and Unos, all targeted at different market niches, much like Lexus and Infiniti are for Toyota and Nissan. As such, in Japan, the RX-7 was launched as an Anfini, the most luxurious of the three marks, but Mazda dropped the name in 1997, allowing the O2 we see here to sport worldwide Mazda branding. That point brings us on to a modified example of the world's favourite sports car, this NA Mazda MX-5, or more correctly, Unos Roadster. That's a quick way to identify a car that's been imported from Japan, that little badge. But what are more important here are the modifications. This is exactly the kind of thing I'd do to an MX-5. Subtleties that make the car individual but don't go over the top, like the paintwork, splitter and wheels, with the real difference under the bonnet and a turbocharger. The reason these cars are so commonly turbocharged is that these engines lap up the boost. In fact, Mazda did turbocharge this engine from the factory, just not in the NA unfortunately. For the best part of three decades, these have been the go-to cars for car enthusiasts, and I feel it's a bit of a shame, therefore, that these are a bit expensive now to get into affordably. The MX-5 was a bit of a rip-off stylistically from a car I mentioned in the first NEC video, but there's another Lotus Elan here, and we've just talked about the MX-5, so it'd be rude not to. And it's on mini lights. This is a Series 4 Elan, and it's just been restored by its owner from what was previously a wreck in a field. But it's also been brushed with a few niceties, some of which you may be able to spot from this shot of the interior, and others you can't see. This has been built to 420 spec, meaning 120 brake horsepower and 110 pound-feet of torque. For a car of this weight and stature, that's perfect. Another car on the Lotus stand is this 1969 Lotus Europa. The Europa is a car that I feel gets neglected alongside your Elans, Esprits and Elises in the lore of Lotus, but it's probably the most focused Lotus car ever designed. The obvious advance with the Europa was of course mounting the engine in the middle, but the bodywork is also a huge part of the Europa's appeal. Though some regard the rear end styling as too utilitarian compared to the smiling and characterful front, it's all for a very good reason, a drag coefficient of 0.2. 2.9. To suit the longitudinal mid-mounted engine setup, Lotus needed an engine and transaxle, and so they went to Renault, as most people know. But the engine they got was perfect for the Europa, as it was light thanks to an aluminium block, helping to keep the weight down to 610 kilograms on the latest models. Sticking with British sports cars, and one much more accessible to the general population is this 1958 Austin Healey Sprite the Frog Eye Sprite. A few months ago, I made a video on one of these, so if you haven't already, why not give it a watch later? This one, however, is rather different. With the simple additions of a hard top and black wires, it somehow transforms what was a very cute little sports car into something still very cute, but now genuinely purposeful, 
It looks like a racing car. This particular sprite, as you can probably tell, is modified. And as they use the venerable A-Series engine, it's not difficult at all to build a sprite with quite a lot more poke than it would have had 60 years ago. This one has been built to 1330cc, producing 100 brake horsepower. In a car that is both so tiny and weighs only 660 kilograms, that's a recipe for incredible fun. And yes, it has had some serious suspension mods to cope with well over double the factory power output. The Mark I Sprite's replacement was of course the Mark II Sprite, launched in 1961. But most people know it better by its badge engineered counterpart, because BMC. And that, of course, is the MG Midget. Technically, this was the first monocoque bodied MG sports car, but as it's really a rebadged sprite, the argument can also be made for the MGB, launched in 62. An argument that seriously erupted in the comments of my MGB GT video from last year. There's another plug there. In contrast to the sprite we've just seen, the midget is in a properly sober specification. But that all adds to the understated charm of such a tiny sports car from an era when most things were very sober. Then we come to the red interior and the soberness just leaves the chat. Notice the interior is virtually the same as the sprites. And as this is a relatively early midget, it still has no exterior door handles. You have to open it from inside. Ultimate simplicity. This video so far has, apart from our little K-Truck friend at the beginning, been dominated by sports cars, and I promise this is the last one. But before we leave the sports car sphere, let's leave the midget and fast forward four decades to its final descendant, the MG TF. This car belongs to my friend Kieran, so I'm duty bound to show it to you, and it has nothing at all to do with the fact that I'm just a bit of a simp for a TF. Nothing at all to do with that. This one is a 2004, meaning it was built within the final 12 months of MG Rover's existence, and it's also a base model. MG Rover would allow you to spec a TF with almost no niceties, but it was very rare for a buyer not to spec up a nice one, especially considering they were buying a mid-engine sports car. What a lot of people don't know about the MGF and TF is that they were all considerably more powerful than their equivalent Mazda MX-5. This base model makes 115 horsepower, while the top spec car with its VVC system made 160. That's a fair amount more than the 145 in a top spec Mazda. So we're done with sports cars, but we're still on MG Rover, and that brings us over to Hall 1 and the Maguire stand with this 2000 Rover Mini Cooper Sport. This is one of the final edition minis, but split from the rest by its huge sports pack wheel arches, 13 inch alloy wheels and quad spot lamps. The post-1997 or Mark 7 minis are also known for their multi-point fuel injection as Rover, thanks to money from BMW, radically revised the mini just to keep it ticking over until the new car was ready in 2001. Thanks to these changes, the Mini had its single biggest upgrade since 1969 and shares relatively few parts with its predecessor. The MPIs were all incredibly well specified and were really quite expensive when new. The Mini was always hand-built and when coupled to exotic specifications, that naturally pushes the price up. As a result, those who bought these cars held them close to their hearts. The owner of this car, for example, ordered it brand new from Rover over 20 years ago with the knowledge that this would be one of the last. Over the years, she's kept this Mini in an incredible state, assisted by keeping the mileage as low as 387. Jumping away from the Maguire stand for just a second, we can look at the other end of the Mini Spectrum and this 1964 Austin Mini Super. Sorry for the compact camera angles for some of these cars, but my camera has a very narrow angle lens and the show had opened by this point so I needed to be considerate of other people. But this Mini is my dream spec for a Mark 1. My favourite 60s BMC colour, almond green, and nothing too radical. Just a white roof, 10 inch mini lights, a rolled tip exhaust, and a few period accessories like the fuel bib. Oh, and twin carburettors under the bonnet. I can't begin to imagine the noise from those trumpets right behind the speedometer. 
Back over to the Maguire stand now and to BL in the decade after the 1970s for this 1978 Morris Marina. Another great colour on this one, denim blue I believe, coupled to a blue vinyl roof for the ultimate dose of the 70s. This marina is incredible. I find it so much more special when an unexceptional family car is preserved or restored to this standard than when an expensive car is. There's a level of care that comes from the heart rather than the wallet, and that's the sign of a true enthusiast. This marina being from 1978 but still with a 1.8 badge on the back indicates that it's one of the last fitted with the old overhead valve B-series engine, the same that you'd find in the likes of the MGB before it was replaced by the overhead cam O-series, the engine that would live through to the times of the Montego. There's another 70s BL saloon car here, but it's really very different to the Marina, and it's this Triumph Dolomite Sprint in full British saloon car championship spec. In the Dolomite video I put out last month, I declared that I believed it to be the best looking British saloon car ever made, but I've changed my mind. I've had the time to think and reflect, and I feel I was a little too quick in forming that conclusion. Instead, I now think it's the best looking saloon car from any country of all time. Next to the BSCC spec sprint is a standard sprint with its bonnet up, so I thought it would be a good time to show you a sprint engine with a single overhead camshaft and 16 valves, the second bank operated with little rockers. Of course, this engine gradually morphed into the long-lived Saab B and H engines, and the third Dolomite on this stand has a Saab engine in it, but not the one you'd expect. This enormously wide-arched dolly has some serious engineering beneath it, and though it isn't finished yet, it does have its power plant on display, and that's not a slant 4-derived Saab engine. Instead, it's a General Motors era engine, the Ecotec, and it has a snail on its side. I don't know the specs of this build, but I can be sure right now that it is well over 200 brake horsepower, and that'll be a right laugh in a Dolomite. Speaking of Saabs and Slant 4s, here's a car with both those things. Probably the most famous implementation of the heavily revised Triumph Slant that Saab christened the H engine, this is a 1985 Saab 900 Turbo. I'm sure I'm like most people in saying that this is my favourite Saab, and a shape that has aged incredibly gracefully. There is something to be said for Saab's different approach to car building and all the aeroplane based propaganda they released when it comes to individuality. Nothing on the roads looks quite like a Saab 900. I'd love one of these things. The thing I find weird about Saabs of this era is the transaxle. The engine is mounted longitudinally, but it drives the front wheels. A number of manufacturers did this for a while, but Saab were still doing it through to the 1990s. Keeping it Swedish for the last one with this beautifully resto modded Volvo Amazon. The Amazon is another incredibly graceful Swedish car from my favourite period of Volvo design. I love the utilitarianism of the 200 series, but the Amazon is just a perfectly proportioned and very pretty family car, especially in two-door form as we see here. This resto mod is just the vibe I'd go for. It lets the styling of the car do the speaking without blinging it out unnecessarily. The subtle shade of blue complements the car's origins brought out by the chrome, and the wheels don't shout over the other elements. They have their place just beefing up the stance of the car. The interior is a little less subtle in red leather, but that too works well as cars from the 60s suit red interiors like the midget we saw before. Under the bonnet is a later B234 Volvo engine producing 210 brake horsepower. That brings us to about the same length as the first video, so for part 2 we'll leave it there. The third and final part of the NEC Classic will be here soon, but until then, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then please do click like and subscribe to TwinCam as well. I'm forever indebted to my wonderful Patreon supporters, and if you'd like to support me that way, then please do follow the link in the description. And I'll have more videos coming along soon.